Okay, time to get started. You're all going to laugh at me. I wrote questions for the uh, reading quiz, but I didn't apparently make the reading quiz. Um, going over, so there was no reading quiz for today, as far as I can know. Going over the record, I don't see Amanda or Michael or Chad or Hannah. Um, okay, Diksha had her back to me. Or Austin. You had your back to me when I was doing my record, so I didn't. Or Sally, or Jaron, or James. It's a large list. There's Sally. Yes, you are, are right on time, Sally. Well, within a minute at least. Okay, so getting started. We are going to now move forward into chapter 15. And in chapter 15, we are going to be talking about thermodynamics. So thermodynamics is talking about interactions involving heat. I have here a steam engine. <laughs> the one on the left, obviously, we're going to recognize. That's just a little teapot that, you know, mom puts on the the wood-burning stove to keep the humidity from going too low in the winter. Then some people heat it up for drinks. I don't appreciate hot drinks. What's going on with the steam kettle that makes it so it actually fits under the category of a steam engine? Anyone? What's going on with the steam kettle that makes it fit in the category of a steam engine? <laughs> well, producing steam is certainly part of it. It's doing what? I can't hear you. Okay, and it's causing movement. And so that causing movement is a big part of what makes a heat engine, a steam engine, is a type of a heat engine. The goal of a heat engine, so steam engines are an example of heat engines. The goal of a heat engine is to convert thermal energy, that is energy something has just because of its temperature, right? Something that's hot. To convert that energy into usable energy. And that usable energy, we give the name mechanical energy. So a steam engine or a heat engine in general, its whole purpose is to convert the energy something has because it's hot into mechanical energy, energy in motion, something we can use. So the one on the right is the earliest known heat engine. Now, of course, this is not the one the hero of Alexandria built. But it is an example of Hero's engine, the oldest engine known to man, the oldest heat engine. And this heat engine, <laughs> maybe I should specify a little more carefully, <laughs> the oldest intentional heat engine <laughs> known to man. This heat engine has, at the bottom of course, a burner to make stuff hot. And in that tub, you have water. You make the water hot. And of course you produce steam. So it's just like the steam kettle. But then that steam is going up on those two supports on the side and going into that ball. And then it comes out the two spouts. But with that steam coming out the two spouts, you notice that the spouts are angled so that when it comes out of those two spouts, no matter which one it comes out of, it's going to make it rotate the same direction. So basically, you put water in that baby, you stoke up the flames, and it starts to spin it. And as soon as it starts spinning, you have that motion that you can capture. You could use a belt drive from that to drive something and make something else move, do some, some useful work. So for a heat engine, because we're trying to convert thermal energy into mechanical energy, we basically are taking heat and converting it to work.
Now, this is not the full schematic of what's going on, but that's the intent. A perfect, a perfect heat engine is not even close to possible, but if you could make a perfect heat engine, it would just straight convert heat to work. The second law of thermodynamics requires that we can't actually make it do what we would like. It's very easy to go the other way. We can easily convert work into heat. For instance, I could take my hands like this, and I converted work into heat. Now, my efficiency wasn't great, but I can do other things and increase the efficiency. So I can almost perfectly convert work into heat. But going the other direction, not so good. First law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics, named the first law because it's the first one that was invented, not the most fundamental, and that's why there's the zeroth law. Does anybody remember what the zeroth law was? I mentioned it before. Okay, here's the technical words for the, the zeroth law. If object A is in thermal equilibrium with object B, and object B is in thermal equilibrium with object C, then object A is in thermal equilibrium with object C. It seems like a lot of extra words. What does thermal equilibrium mean? It means if you bring the two things in contact, no heat flows. What direction does heat always flow? From hotter to colder. Not from the one that has more internal energy to less internal energy or anything else. It's always from hotter to colder. So if you bring them together and no heat flows, then they must have the same temperature. So that in thermal equilibrium with is a precise way of saying has the same temperature as. And so then we have temperature A equals temperature B and temperature B equals temperature C. Then temperature A equals temperature C. So that's the zeroth law because it's more fundamental but it was thought to be obvious until they learned more about what temperature was. The first law is simply a statement of energy conservation. So I put here in red, the conservation of energy principle. Conservation of energy says energy cannot be created or destroyed. Now just a little technicality. In a class like this, you learn initially mass conservation, that mass can't be created or destroyed. And then later on, when we get to the end of second semester, we learn, hey, that was wrong. Mass is not conserved. We create and destroy mass all the stinking time. Back there on the wall, I have a diagram of fusion. The sun is producing the energy we receive from it by fusing hydrogen into helium. And in so doing, there is mass lost. And that mass is released as energy. And so mass, according to Einstein, is just a form of energy. So this law is still considered universally absolutely correct. And mass is just a type of energy. So mass is not necessarily conserved, but energy has to be. So how does that apply here for thermodynamics? First, we have to identify a system. So in this picture, I have a circle. That's the system. OK, it's not a circle, it's an oval. I should have looked down before I said. This oval is the system. So anything within it, that's the system. And we say the system has an internal energy U. So U, okay, I'm going to start over because that's not pretty enough. U is the internal energy. Now I hope, well, this might be one of the questions that I made but didn't give you because I forgot. Did you have a question, anyone, a reading quiz question in the past about what is internal energy? What is included in internal energy? That is probably one of the ones that should have been in today's reading quiz that I forgot to make. Um, internal energy is the sum of all of the mechanical energy contained by the system. So mechanical energy, what things are mechanical energy? Kinetic. Okay, so all of the kinetic energy, whether it's rotational kinetic energy or translational kinetic energy, goes into the internal energy. There's another kind of mechanical energy that we've talked about that we have in our materials. Can anybody think of another one? We have also vibrational. Uh, well, we call it vibrational because it contains two things. The potential energy of a spring, in this case it's not a spring, it's an electro... <laughs> It's an electric bond. We have the potential energy of those bonds. 
So that also is actually going into this. You have the stretched bond and the vibration in that. So all of those are going into the internal energy. What does delta mean? This is a really simple question going way back. What does delta mean? Change it. So this equation says the change in the internal energy, so the in change of the, in the mechanical energy contained by the material is equal to Q minus W. What does the symbol Q stand for? Heat. Now, you probably noted that on the last test, depending on which problem you were looking at, Q could stand for two different things. It also was the symbol for flow rate. You have to be careful we do reuse symbols. So I have had in the past on tests, people will use R for, you know, they'll use an equation that has R for resistance in a situation with, where R was supposed to be radius. You know, you do have to know what the symbols mean in the equations. Don't just, you know, try to randomly match them up because the symbols mean different things in different contexts. So here the Q is the heat. W, that's simpler probably, work. So we have the change in internal energy is equal to heat minus work. Now you look at those signs and it seems odd. In fact, the textbook I used last year had the same law written as delta U is equal to Q plus W. Now how confusing is that to have two different textbooks and two different equations for the same law? And the difference comes down to the definition of what Q is and what W is. So I put in red here again, Q is the heat added to the system. So heat that comes into the system is a positive Q. Heat that goes out is a negative Q. W is the work done by, <clears throat> excuse me, by the system. So if the system does work on something else, that's a positive W. If something else does work on the system, that's a negative W. Now, if we go back to what we understand of work, if I am going to do work on this backpack, well, let's, let's take my tablet. If I'm going to do a positive work in this tablet, I'm doing a work against gravity, right? So what direction do I need to push it for me to do a positive work? And you're absolutely right, Alexis. She says, up. I need to push up. Why? My force is up, and I need the motion to be up for me to do a positive work. If I go down, the force I was applying to the tablet was still up. But the direction was down, that was a negative work. So we're going to have the same type of thing when we look at thermodynamic problems. If we have a gas expanding, the force it puts on its boundaries are always outward. So if it expands, then it had to do a positive work. If it contracts, it did a negative work, something else did a positive work on it. So with our definition that W is the work done by the system, Work is going to be positive for an expanding gas, negative for contracting gas. So this shows here Q is the Q in minus Q out since Q is the, work, is the heat added to the system. But work is work out minus work in because work is the work done by the system. So the work is energy going out. That's why it had a negative sign there. Like I said, my other textbook, it had work was the work done on the system, so it was energy coming in, and it changed the sign. So if you, like, use an Internet resource and look for something on the first law, be aware that you will find two different sign conventions. So you have to know, you have to know the fundamental rule of what the law is so you can look at it and know, oh, they use this sign convention and not get really confused. I love the way I go through slides in rapid-fire nature. Okay, our first clicker question. What variables does the first law of thermodynamics relate? And you can answer now. Chard A is in, no one else is in, just in case anyone clicked the button before I set it up. Okay, everybody's answered. 
one, zero, 20, and zero. All right. All but one person said the first law relates to these. I don't think we need discussion between people to figure out what you answered and why, because we had all but one. But let's review these. P, V, N, and T. We have an equation that relates them. It's just not the first law. What is that equation? The ideal gas law that says PV is equal to NKT. Now, I put a subscript of B there for Boltzmann constant because we do use K in different contexts as well. We had K in two contexts in this last test. Uh, was it just two? It might have been more, right? Because we had K for the thermal conductivity coefficient. We had K for Boltzmann constant in the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Um, trying to think, well, I, maybe it was just those two. But if you put a subscript to B, then it's very specific. It's the Boltzmann constant, Maxwell Boltzmann. Yes, Boltzmann. Not. So this here is called an equation of state. And it relates the state variables. So pressure, volume, number of molecules, and temperature. Those are variables that tell you what the state of the gas is. The first law is just dealing in energy. U is the internal energy. Q is heat. It's a transfer process of energy. Nothing can contain heat. It's a transfer. It is just a measurement to say change, you know, energy that flowed that didn't involve work. And work is energy that flowed due to work, you know, due to physical motion. This one here I put as a distractor because the first law is energy conservation, but we never write it in terms of total energy, kinetic energy, and potential energy, so that's why that wasn't the right answer. And I just couldn't think of anything, so B was crazy. Just trying to find some distractor. Okay, two more clicker questions here, so you can answer this one now. What is the correct definition of Q in the first law of thermodynamics? Okay, this one wasn't so clear cut. We had 11, 2, 8. That is a, a majority of 1. Um, this is a good one to talk to the people around you and talk about what heat and work are, what their sign conventions are. Talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> With prejudice? <laughs> okay, let's try repolling this. Um, give me a second, it takes, you know, two clicks or whatever. Okay, you can answer again now for the second time. Jaron was first in. Just so you know. Okay, y'all are a bunch of haters. So I said, y'all are a bunch of haters. What did I say very specifically about heat? It doesn't change. Yeah, nothing can contain heat. This one can't be right. So then we're just left with the other two, the direction heat flows. And yeah, the, these people were right. 
Q is the heat added to the system. I really hope the three of you who dismissed this with prejudice had that answer and not the other one. Okay, another clicker question. So, okay. Yes. If Q is negative, or that's just theoretically we're saying we're adding negative. If Q is negative, then that means that heat went out of the system. Right. But I guess, because at first we said it was the net heat transfer. Uh, first. Uh, no. I, I had in, in red that it was the heat transferred into. Right. So it's the... <laughs> okay. Anyway, we have another question here. What is the correct definition of W in the first law of thermodynamics? No. <laughs> Who said that? Who's that? <laughs> okay. This time we did better. Thank you. I don't want these questions to be a mockery of learning. I want them to be something that has... So nobody answered the work contained by the system. That's the thing I'm saying thank you about. Because, of course, you also can't contain work by it. Work is a transfer, just like heat is a transfer. So the work, the W, in the way our textbook, which is the majority way, is defined, work is the work done by the system. And you might wonder, why is that the majority way? You know, it does seem like you'd say, well, the change in internal energy, let's make everything positive. It's going to increase it. The reason that's the general way is because it just makes sense to us that we want it to be a positive work when we have it expanding because by all the rules we learned of work, that's a positive work. With heat, we don't have all those rules that we've already learned. So the correct answer was... The work done by the system, if it expands, that's a positive work. Oh, I thought Dixie was talking to me. I just heard that, hmm, and I was like, uh-oh. Okay. Now, something about this, the first law is not a state equation. It's an equation relating energy. A state, if you're in the same pressure, volume, temperature, number of molecules, you're in the same state. It doesn't matter how you got there. So... You can have different processes to lead you to the same state. So in this diagram, we're saying, let's suppose we have a system, and we start with internal energy U. I don't even care what the number is. I start with internal energy U. And in process A, we had 4 joules come in, 10 joules go out. It's kind of interesting that they put work in as minus 4 joules because if you use the word in, that specifies the direction, and then they've essentially done a double negative by putting the negative sign with it. But they want to make sure that we remember work in is negative, work out is positive. So that's why it has the funny sign. So you have a net work out of 6 joules, and then you have 40 joules of heat that comes in, and 25 joules that leave, so you have a net heat in of 15 joules. So if you have a net heat in of 15 joules and a net work out of 6 joules, then the change in energy for the system had add 15, take away 6, it went up 9 joules. Now the second example just has... 159 joules of work done to the system, so you brought in 159 joules, and then you had heat that went out of the system to the tune of 150 joules. And so you put in 159, you remove 150, you have a net increase in 9 joules. So the energy went up by the same amount, even though the heats were very different and the works were very different, the system is going to be in the same state after both of these processes. Right? Does it? You can have multiple ways of getting to the same state. So why do I spend four minutes on this slide? Just so we realize a state is you know, a combination of pressure, volume, temperature, and number of molecules. And you can get to that state many different ways. 
The first law of thermodynamics doesn't just apply to the simple textbook cases that we'll be discussing in class. So here are two examples from nature. It applies to everything. So in our bodies, we take in energy by eating food. That was actually a question on one of our Flip Fridays, I think. Um, we have energy that leaves our bodies in the form of us doing work and us, us giving off heat. If you're not gaining or losing weight, then your change in internal energy is zero, and the amount of energy you take in with the food is going to equal the amount of work that goes, you know, energy that goes out from work and the amount of energy that goes out in heat. <coughs> that makes sense? What happens if you take in more energy in food than you exhaust in work and heat? You store it. You store it in different kinds of body tissue. We would like to store it in muscle because we always want to, well, for guys, most of us want to be big and beefy, you know? But of course, you have to actually do some work to get that stored in the muscle. Instead, for many of us, it goes right here in this fat category. That's my body storing energy. So, if we go into a situation where there's plenty of water but no food, I can last longer than you. I mean, Assuming I don't get into some acidosis state, but you know, I have more energy stored up. And that's what I'm going to stick with. So how does a heat engine work? We're going to start getting to the practical heat engine. For a heat engine, you put in heat, you get out work. That was my ideal picture. Here's a realistic picture. The realistic picture, you put in heat at a high temperature, and you get out both work and heat at a low temperature. Now this textbook isn't really careful about these. Most textbooks are. You notice that this here is wider than this or this. Most textbooks are very careful to make it so you have something that looks like this. Meh, change color. You have heat that comes in, heat that comes out, and work that comes out. And they want to make sure it's clear that the amount of heat that comes out plus the work that comes out is equal to the amount of heat that comes in. So they use the widths of those so that they add up. In this picture, it looks to me like they don't add up. In a heat engine, once you have it running in a consistent manner, it's not going to store or drain energy. It's just going to stay in constant internal energy. The end of each cycle will be back to the same situation. Let's think about the most common heat engine we have. Gonna pick on, yes, they looked up already. Pick on the people who are busy on their phones. So I'm gonna go with uh, the dragon here because he looked the most involved. <laughs> most common heat? Uh, heat engine that we deal with. Not counting our bodies or natural things. So oh, I was gonna say my body. Um, <laughs> well, uh, a car engine. A car engine. Car engine is the most common heat engine you probably interact with. Now, you have this car engine, and I think we'd all agree that when you start the car, and that, especially today, the engine was pretty cold. But what happened to the temperature of the engine? It warmed up. While it was warming up, the internal energy of the engine was increasing, right? Because temperature is telling you about the average translational kinetic energy if you're talking about an ideal gas. As you increase the temperature, you're increasing the internal energy. So as it warmed up, you were increasing internal energy. But it doesn't warm up forever. If it did, what would happen if you drove from here to California? <laughs> or from here to, you know, let's go here to Denver. What happens to your engine if it just kept warming up at the same rate that it was warming up when you started it? It would <coughs> melt, right? That would be rather catastrophic. In order for your engine to keep running, it has to reach a steady state where for each cycle, 
the temperature remains the same after it's done. And so that's one of our rules for a heat engine. We're not going to talk about what happens when we're starting it up. We're saying once it's running in a continuous fashion, it has to have the internal energy doesn't change if you go through one complete cycle. Well, in that case, if you take our first law of thermodynamics, delta U is equal to Q minus W. The Q, what was the Q's definition? The heat that's what? The heat that's added to the system. So if I look at this, I had Q in was added, and of course Q out was taken out. So my Q, and I better change color so it's not confusing. My Q is equal to Q in minus Q out. And the work is the heat done, or is the work done by the system, so it just remains work. I won't, I won't be ridiculous and put W equals W. And so if I put these into that equation with the requirement that delta U is equal to zero for a complete cycle, then we end up with the relationship shown right here. That is, you just add work to both sides. And the work that comes out of the heat engine is equal to the heat that was put in minus the heat that was exhausted. Now, once again, any intelligent person can look at this and say, OK, I have heat from my hot engine. How can I get the maximum work from that heat in terms of the heat that's exhausted? What, what exhausted heat would give me the maximum work done by the engine? If I exhaust no heat, if I can make a heat engine with no exhausted energy, or exhausted heat, then it would put it all into work. If that was the case, you know, the tailpipe of the car would just be air temperature. That would be the goal for a car. The second law of thermodynamics tells us that's not possible. And we will learn the last thing we have in today's lecture, should we get there, is on the Carnot cycle. The Carnot cycle is a theoretical heat engine that gives you the best possible performance that's allowed by physics. And so that sets the goal then. So when you're making a car engine, you're like, how close am I to the efficiency? The efficiency being the work I get out divided by the heat I put in that would be attainable with Carnot engine. So we'll learn more about that later. But the second law of thermodynamics, what is the second law? There are a couple statements. I have a slide later, but I'll give you the two statements right now. Just watch it be the next slide. Um, just so we can talk about things a little intelligently since I said it like three times. The second law of thermodynamics has a number of different statements. The most important ones for our class are, number one, the Clausius statement, the one that I have actually already verbally told you in class today. The Clausius statement of the second law of thermodynamics says that heat naturally flows from hotter to colder materials. You put two objects in thermal contact, the heat will naturally flow from the hotter to the colder. That is, a, that is the Clausius statement. Now, if you go read it, you'll find more complex and technical versions of it, but that's the essence. The second one that you're probably familiar with, I think it's the Planck statement, says that the entropy of the universe naturally increases for any um, system, for any process. And so we'll look at that not today, but in the coming days. There are some other statements like the Kelvin statement or, or the Carnot statement. Um, I think the Kelvin statement essentially is the third law. Well, the Kelvin statement is you can't ever reach a temperature lower than the lowest of your two temperatures if you start with two different temperature things. And the, uh, the Carnot statement says that you can't <laughs> improve on the efficiency of the Carnot engine, if I remember right. OK, so when I say the second law, usually in terms of heat engine, we think about that entropy part that is what's limiting the efficiency you can have. And of course, I haven't defined entropy, and I won't be defining entropy today. So we only go that far today with it. Here's an example of a steam engine. Now, that's a very simplified example. This, what was that? 
Oh my God. No. It's the example of the steam engine, you have water, you boil it. When you boil water, the water expands incredibly. And so, you know, one of the things that is bad, you know, like when you're fighting a fire, you throw water on the fire, the water changes phase. It takes a lot of heat, right? 334 joules per gram? Yeah. 334 joules per gram to take water at 100 degrees Celsius and convert it to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. And expands by, I think it's a factor of 1,500 times in volume when you change it from water to steam. And so why do we use water to put out fires? Because of all of the heat that it must go from the fire into the water to make it turn to steam. But then you have the problem if you're in a confined space and you turn all that water to steam, you now have scalding steam flying back at you. So firefighters have to be careful of that. You don't want to just, you know, be in this small confined space. Ah, i got to throw some water on it and, you know, fry myself. That would be bad. Of course, if you're going to structures, you do have your structure gear. How many people have had to put on structure gear? None? Ah. We had to do things like crawl under the basement of a house, or not, under the floorboards of a house in our structure gear. Not all that fun. Uh, anyway, moving on. That steam, because it expanded so much, it's going to generate a high pressure if you're in a confined space. Now, we can't use the ideal gas law for a steam engine. Why not? It's not ideal. It's close to the temperature of liquefaction. It's close to the boiling temperature if we went from water to steam. So we would have to use something like the Van der Waals equation. Van der Waals equation, okay, pronounce it right. It's probably van der Waals, right? V is pronounced like an F, W is pronounced like a V, right? <laughs> um, the uh, Van der Waals, we say in English, equation of state is an equation of state that allows you to have a gas that is not far away from liquefaction, that is more compressed. And so it has coefficients A and B to deal with those two non-ideal behaviors. So that's what you'd have to do for this. We don't care. I actually, okay, you guys remember a year ago almost when New England was accused of cheating once again. I mean, they, not the first time, probably won't be the last time. In this case, because their balls were underinflated at halftime. And we had plenty of people saying, well, you know, physics says what happens to the pressure when the temperature drops. It should drop, PV equals NRT. Well, if you go through and do the calculations, it becomes clear that those balls would have had to gone from essentially 100 degrees Fahrenheit down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit to account for the smallest possible change that would have been flagged as a problem, which is unlikely, right? But I was not satisfied with that calculation, so I did it with the Van der Waals equation as well. It came out to be you know, within 1% of the same. And so the people who were saying that physics said that that was a possible outcome, they were lying. <laughs> um, or they didn't know their physics. It could be that too. They're, yeah, I won't go further on that. Oh, I, I do need to finish this out, though, before I go to the next slide. Okay, so we have this high-pressure steam. The high-pressure steam, this here is shown with a reciprocating piston. You let the steam go into a chamber where it pushes the piston back. You have pressure, which makes a force going into the piston. If it moves back, then that did work on the piston. That is our creation of the mechanical energy, pushing that piston. You could have also had something like a turbine, where you have the high-pressure steam pushes on a blade and makes that blade rotate out of its way, once again doing work. <clears throat> and then you have down here a condenser, a cool place, where the steam can condense, pressure drops dramatically, and you have a cycle that you repeat. And what you've done is converted energy from your boiler, from whatever was under here burning, into mechanical energy. And I have like three slides that deal with that, but first I do have a clicker question. What is the purpose of a heat engine?
Okay. We had interesting motion in the answers people gave. Well, there was a pretty good consensus. There's still only three, <laughs> a majority of three, but, uh, you know, we'll take it. The goal is to convert heat into mechanical energy. Now, that heat will temporarily raise the internal energy, but for one complete cycle, the internal energy comes back down and gives off both heat and work, and the work is the thing we want. I guess I could have put to convert heat into heat. It does do that, but that's not its goal. All right, and we're halfway through the intended slides. How we get heat from work. Here's a slide illustrating how a piston, a reciprocating piston works. Um, you put the heat in. Let's just imagine that we had a cylinder and we put gas in there. We put heat in. What's going to happen to the pressure? It's going to increase. So the pressure increases. The pressure increases. It's going to push on this piston. If we allow the piston to move, it pushes the piston back. And it does a work. Um, on the next slide, I actually have a graphic for the work, so I'm not going to go into that. It does some work. Then we have to actually push the piston back out, compressing the gas somewhat. That'd be a negative work. <clears throat> and we're able to start over. So the way we're doing the work is the pressure pushing the piston back. Now, here we show a picture, and I have the word isobaric. Isobaric. Um, I always try to get this word right, and then I can't remember if it's isobaric or isobaric. I think it's isobaric. Um, iso means the same. Isobaric means the same pressure. So an isobaric process is a process in which the pressure is constant. So for our first derivation of the equation for thermodynamic work, we start by saying we're going to do an isobaric process. We're going to have constant pressure in this gas, and I'm going to compress it. So if I have constant pressure and I'm compressing it, or actually, I guess, this, they did expansion. I should have looked more carefully. They did expansion. So if it's constant pressure and it's expanding... I'm going to have to keep putting energy in to keep the pressure constant. So this process is going to have heat flowing in necessary. That's not our goal to consider. It's just, what's the work done? So I have a pressure applied to the surface. So on that surface, I can say the force applied to the surface is equal to, how does force relate to pressure? Force is pressure times area. And so the work is equal to the force vector dotted to delta x vector. Well, in the picture that's shown, the force is up and the motion, they use d for the motion here. The motion here will also be up. So those are the same direction. If they're the same direction. What does the dot product mean? Got to ask that before I say what the result is. Multiplying just the parallel parts. So if they're the same direction, they're parallel to each other, and I just multiply them. So that means I'm going to get this is equal to my force. Now I, went, I go to the magnitude, PA, times the distance it moves, D. So the work is the pressure times the area times the distance. Well, for my nice pretty cylinder, it turns out that area times distance is the volume change for my cylinder, for my gas. My gas increased by a volume of AD. And it turns out, right, this is not a proof of the mathematics of this equation. This is only for one case. But it turns out that it's still generally true that the work is equal to pressure multiplied by the change in volume. So I have on the left here a graph showing pressure versus volume. And if I have a process that starts at A, goes out here to B, that expanded, if it expands, should it be a positive or negative work? Positive. So that's a positive work, and the work is the pressure times the change in volume. Well, the change in volume is the run part. The pressure is the rise part. 
<coughs> so pressure times change in volume is just the area of that rectangle. And now this actually is a soundproof. That's always the case. The work done by a system is always the area above zero pressure underneath the line on your PV diagram. If you expand, it's a positive work. If you contract, it's negative. So if we go the direction the arrow is, if it expands, we have a positive work of this pressure times this change in volume. If it was a negative, well, then it would have been negative work, or excuse me, if it contracted, then it would have been negative work of the same amount. Now let's move on to what if it's not a constant pressure? As I said, that wasn't a proof for all cases, but it turns out it is true that for all cases, work is pressure times change in volume. So I could take you know, some changing pressure and just break it up into a whole lot of tiny little rectangles and calculate the area of each rectangle. But when I do that, in the end, I've just calculated the area underneath the curve again. So just like we learned at the very beginning of the semester when we talked about if I have the speed as a function of time, I can find the area that was traveled by taking the area underneath that curve. Same thing here. If I have the pressure as a function of volume, I can find the work done in going from point A to point B by just taking the area under that curve. With the arrow shown here, it's going to the left. So is that a positive or negative work? The arrow is going to the left. Did the volume increase or decrease? It decreased. And if the volume decreases, is that positive or negative work? Negative. Okay, so we can just look at these graphs and calculate from the graphs. Or we can use the equation work is equal to P delta V. Now, let us note that the equation was not work is equal to the change in pressure times volume. Right, we had... That is not the same as change in pressure times volume. It's also not the same as change in pressure times volume. So you do have to be careful. On this diagram, we have two processes. We have isobaric. What did isobaric mean? It's a constant pressure. Going from B to C, it's labeled it here as isochoric. What would you tell me is constant, right? Iso means constant. What would you tell me is constant going from B to C? Volume. So isochoric means, and there's another term for it, isovolumetric. It means the same volume. The volume doesn't change. Now, in an isochoric process, how much work is done? None. Why none? Somebody over on this side of the classroom, why none? Okay, work is P delta V. If delta V is zero, then work is going to be zero. So for an isochoric process, I don't like magenta color, don't like green that much better. For an isochoric process, that's my phone. I'm sure it's no good. Sorry. Delta V is zero, so work is equal to P times zero is equal to zero. Now if we go back to the first law, the first law then becomes delta U is equal to Q minus zero. So the change in internal energy is just equal to the heat in an isochoric process. A little simplification there. Now this figure shows a cycle going from A to B to C. It uh, doesn't show it complete. The bottom one does. A cycle going from A to B to C to D back to A. When you get back to A, you're at the same pressure and volume. If N hasn't changed and it's an ideal gas, that means you're at the same temperature as well. So you're at the same state. A is the same state, whether you start there or you went around the loop and got back to there. So what does that tell you about the internal energy if you're back in the same state? 
It has to be the same internal energy. You came back to the same internal energy. If you look at this, was there any work going from A to B? Yes. We have numbers here. We can calculate. The pressure was 1.5 times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter squared. The change in volume was 500 centimeters cubed. Multiply those together and pay attention to the units because a centimeter cubed is not the same as a meter cubed. I can calculate the work. If I go from B to C, what do you tell me about the work? None. Going from C to D, what about the work? It's negative, and since this is 2 times 10 to the 5th instead of 1.5 times 10 to the 6th for the pressure, I do pressure times change of volume, I get a much smaller negative work. And then going D to A is zero work, so my net work is a positive work here. The work is equal to the area enclosed by this, and if you do a clockwise cycle, it's a positive work. If you do a counterclockwise, it's going to be negative. Because clockwise means that the higher pressure is on top. Counterclockwise, you'd have, oh, excuse me, not higher pressure on top, but the, uh, the expansion is on top. Okay, we're out of time. See you on Friday. Yeah. I think on the next slide, if What's the work? And so I can take this and say, well, pressure is equal to that, and then put it into this equation. And so I have the work is equal to, I'll bring the constant stuff outside. And then you integrate that. Um, it's always convenient to use P final, V final to gamma is equal to P initial, one initial to the gamma to uh, simplify it. But you get the actual equation for the work that way. So then is gamma like an actual constant or something? Yeah, or gamma is like a constant that has to do with the, um, the constant pressure, um, heat capacity, and the constant volume heat capacity. And obviously, we haven't learned about those yet. Oh, I know the.